The first story is about being fired for protecting my co-workers and feeling the heat in return. So this is a few years old, during my first year of varsity. I had just started university and was enrolled in demanding medical program. As the kid of a single mom who had not worked since I was 15, I clearly needed a job to fund my living expenses, which my scholarship did not cover. So I started working part-time in a bookshop in my local mall because it fit my personality and I enjoy books in general. However, the remuneration was as close to the minimum wage as humanly conceivable. So six months in, I'm doing well and have been promoted to night manager. My responsibilities include overseeing the night workers, most of whom are students like myself and two late twenties girls, both of whom have children. A week into my tenure as night manager, I receive a directive from the head office stating that we are not selling enough books and that we are not trying. To put things into perspective, this was around the time that Kindles and other forms of e-readers were becoming popular, so physical book sales had decreased dramatically. To address this issue, they were bringing down a new shop manager to take over, while our present store manager would take on a small supervisory function. Three days later, the new manager walks in, a short lesbian woman who despises men and is bipolar, hereafter referred to as Bipolar B or PB. Needless to say, I stroll through to the back for our daily shift change meeting, during which they introduce her. She greets us all and then asks all of the managers to stay behind so that everyone may filter out, leaving only four managers, myself as the night manager, the day manager, the stock manager, and our prior store manager. So Andrew turns to me and asks what I am still doing there. I calmly explain that I am the night manager. She hears this and checks with everyone else to confirm. Once they establish the veracity of my remarks, she looks at me squarely and gives us the whole rundown on how things are going to change around here. Six months later, not much has changed. Zachary has been nothing but passive aggressive to me and others, and everyone has noticed to the point where everyone in our store has developed a strong disdain for her. Managers are summoned to a meeting. We learn that the business will be closed in a week for two months for a renovation. I immediately inquired about the short notice. The night crew is paid on a shift-by-shift -shift basis. A week's notice is insufficient time to make alternate plans. Andrew lashes out at me, claiming that they are unimportant and easily replaced. I point out that two of them rely on this employment to support their families, and they cannot live without it. All the other managers agree with me on this aspect. Andrew immediately backs down and says we'll pay them a base salary for one month and hire them as painters. Now, my neighbor is a painter by trade, and I know they make at least twice what we do per hour. So I point this out and ask if she'll pay for their training. She then lashes out at me for being smart, Alec. Okay, perhaps I deserve it. Eventually, she says we'll meet tomorrow to finalize her decision. The time she chooses, however, is an hour and a half before my shift begins and coincides with one of my final tests. When I bring this out, Andrew gives me an evil grin and adds, if you don't make it in tomorrow, don't bother coming in ever again. A week later, I learned that all three of my co-workers on the night shift had been let go without compensation and told to reapply when the business reopened. Everyone who had been openly friendly with me was told not to return. This puts me in a rage. It's one thing to tamper with me, but to also mess with my co-workers. That is too far. I immediately called the headquarters to complain, but was completely ignored, held on the line, and transferred from department to department. I eventually had enough. I filed a detailed report with my country's business control council, reporting the corporation rather than the store for poor business practices and the wrongful layoff of many employees. I then sent an email to the corporation's human resources department, describing what I had done and why. I advised them that if they found a method to correct what they had done, I would update my complaint to include the name of the store manager. It took three days to obtain a response. They rented a modest store for everyone to work in. 
Because of the tight timeline, the improvements were costly, and they revived everyone while suspending Andrew without pay until further notice. I promptly fulfilled my commitment and revised my complaint. The investigation was completed, and Andrew lost her job permanently, with no hope of a reference. I've worked for the company for 20 years. With a 20-year gap in her resume, it's been difficult for her to obtain suitable work. I saw her working as a packer at my local supermarket the other day, which prompted me to think about the incident. The second story is that you should not insult your staff if you do not know how to run a firm. Backstory. I worked in the vaping sector from 2013 to 2019, with four of those years spent in management. However, my actual interest is graphic design. I grew up around art. My mother is a professional photographer who introduced me to Photoshop when I was 12 years old. 1999. I learned through dissection and hands-on experience. I never went to design school. Instead, I learned from others in the field and by observing what they were doing. By my mid-twenties, I regarded myself as just shy of a design professional. I've applied my design, advertising, and marketing talents to every retail job I've ever had, and they serve both myself and my employers extremely well. The task. Three years into my vaping career, my girlfriend, now wife, obtained a job outside of town, and I relocated with her. She makes a lot of money, therefore, she takes the initiative. I quickly secured a position as manager and graphic designer at a freshly founded vape business. My resume was a stunning full-color creative piece that effortlessly fit into my impressive portfolio. It was evident that I knew what I was doing, and I had references to prove it. Unfortunately, there were numerous red signals that I should have picked up on from the start. However, I am a naturally trustworthy person, sometimes to a fault. Jonathan, the proprietor, knew very little about the industry. He'd started vaping six months ago and decided he liked it enough to create a shop. If anyone here was or was a professional in the field, you understand how wrong this is. In this field, crash course 100, and one fails to provide adequate product knowledge and sales techniques. Products, safety, usefulness, and product fit all require extensive research to understand well enough to market successfully. Owen, I requested $12 per hour, which I thought was more than acceptable for being the only employee, manager, and graphic designer for a franchise vape business. I was promised 10 per hour, but you'll be working 50 hours a week, which equates to about 12 per hour. Hint, it doesn't. I needed the job, so I accepted it and immediately went to work studying the items on hand and determining what images the company would allow me to use and how to apply them. Hunter, I know my products. I understand the chemistry and science of devices and liquids. Dark juice isn't awful, but the owner assumed it was. After a cursory review of its research, I received the following response. I don't believe you know what you say you know. This quote is the most verbatim of any on this page and it will be repeated. Adrian, this was a new store with few customers. Sales were intermittent, if they occurred at all. The owner didn't have the money for an advertising budget, so if he relied solely on word of mouth and a tiny magnet I designed for the side of his moving bus truck. Regardless of how busy the owner was with his moving firm, he always seemed to find time to watch me make sales remotely via camera. As soon as a customer left, the phone rang, and I was bombarded with questions about what they purchased, why I didn't upsell them, and a list of ways I might do better and sell the high-dollar things. Selling people unnecessary items is a terrific way to ensure that customers never return. Even, there were two more instances where the remark, I don't think you know what you think you know was used. Unfortunately, I had given up on trying to move this firm ahead and I can't even recall what they were about other than that they involved my design and marketing expertise, vengeance, and aftermath. After the third time it was said to me, I slapped my key on the table, told him he'd better never say that to anyone else, and stormed out for good.
The vindictive element was that he had just dropped in to restock himself and desperately needed to get back to his moving company clients. That won't happen tonight, FO good luck closing the store you don't know anything about. Now he had to spend more money than he was paying me to cover workers for his moving firm, all while attempting to sell things he was unfamiliar with. A few weeks after I left, the front windows were broken and everything was stolen. I had nothing to do with it. It was Xavier's section of town, which happened frequently in the area. The windows were boarded up for a few weeks, and he purchased a new item. Then it occurred again, but not to me. Three weeks later, he was locked out due to non-payment of rent. He had to pay significant fees to the corporation since he signed a five-year contract that expired in less than six months. This could have been prevented if he had followed my advice and let the management run the firm. I even emphasized the inadequacy of security procedures that resulted in the break-ins. Unfortunately, he knew better than I did, and the best way to exact retribution was to turn his entire professional life upside down and prove him completely incorrect. You could argue that he does not know what he claims to know. The final incident involves an alcoholic employer who opted to neglect employee wages and treat us like pure garbage for months on end. This occurred back when I was in college in Canada, working part-time as a dishwasher in a restaurant. A little background on the restaurant owner. He was an alcoholic. He'd pop open a drink after opening the eatery for the day. Then he would drink non-stop all day, all day every day. And when he did, he yelled and swore at his workers. He would continue drinking in the evenings and he would occasionally pass out. Because I was responsible for cleaning, I was frequently the last one to go at the end of the day. He drank so much one night that he passed out on the restaurant's back seats and then shouted at me the next day for not taking him up. I later discovered that he slept through the night with all of the lights on inside the restaurant and the front entrance unmocked. But I digress. The biggest surprise was how the owner thought he could mess with our wages, shortchanging us in the most obvious manner conceivable, and get away with it. He had a logbook where we could record our hours worked. Unfortunately, when it came to calculating our wages, he treated the minutes as decimals. That is 15 minutes equals 0.15 hours, 30 minutes equals 0.30 hours, and 45 minutes equals 0.45 hours. And he did this every day that we worked. He was very much linked to what he saw as the Chinese working culture, a 996-hour workweek for full-time employees. Straight sub-minimum wages, no overtime, no holiday pay, etc., and any suggestion otherwise was treated with direct verbal abuse. There were no breaks. We worked ceaselessly. When I did have a little break, I had worked 15 hours straight, and he felt I was about to burn out right where I was standing. I was still in college. Therefore, I didn't understand my legal rights adequately. He made it obvious that it was not open for discussion, but I had a strong suspicion that something was wrong. It disturbed me so much that I had to do something about it. I simply took on this job to supplement my income. I was handing out resumes one day, and he quickly hired me. He received my resume in the afternoon and instructed me to start working that evening. I didn't like being yelled at, but I assumed it was simply part of the work, so I toughed it out as he bombarded me several times a day. I eventually got used to it, but deep inside, I was outraged. I wanted out, but I wasn't sure how. At the same time, I needed to get something done. Then an opportunity presented itself. The final straw was his request that I work on Canada Day. My shift was scheduled from 11 a.m. to roughly 3 a.m. the next day, with no bonus, holiday pay, or anything else, and for a sub-minimum salary. That is it. No breaks either, remember. Of course, I abandoned him when that day arrived. He requested it 20 times in the last two months, and I said no each time. When he approached me, he didn't ask. He informed me I had to work that day under those conditions. He dismissed me the next day. I couldn't be more thrilled. 
I went to the lab or board and called him out. I told them everything. I also informed them where to find the notebook containing all of the proof. The officer from the Lego board gave me a serious look and said he would look into this properly. The owner was legitimately hiring study abroad students from China to do filthy work for him and treating them like utter Xavier's. One of the waitresses informed me she was paid as little as $6 per hour. The officer from the Lego board ordered the owner to give me more than $1,000 in compensation. A few days later, I returned to the restaurant with a friend to pay the remainder of my bill. I received a few missed calls from the owner after that, so I blocked his number. What about the cherry on top? I believe they were audited or something, since shortly after my complaint, I walked past it and saw it fully boarded up. I checked Google, and the location was listed as permanently closed. 